most of what's in here was something I prepared some time ago for classes in homeopathy I was teaching. The, the points, two other points that I'm emphasizing here in this presentation for you that I think is of some interest is that there was an alternative way to treat epidemics. It's not it's the only one, but there was an alternative. And then the second thing is the, the background politically. Okay, when, when it was demonstrated that homeopathy was effective in epidemics, why has it disappeared? Kind of. It's not disappeared, but you know, it's pretty small compared to conventional. So again, it's bringing out the whole thing about politics. People should understand about the state of medicine today, which is behind the vaccines, right? Okay, so, so we'll start with this. And because uh, I'm going to talk primarily about the, about the United States. So as a little bit of background, homeopathy was brought to the United States in 1825 by this fellow here, Hans Birch Graham. He was born, uh, actually, was born in Boston. And, uh, and, but he went then to Copenhagen, where he went to medical school and was educated there. And then he, um, when he graduated, he became an assistant physician to the king and he had a, a practice there for about 20 years in Copenhagen. So he then came across homeopathy. Uh, he learned it from a Dr. Lund who studied with Dr. Hahnemann who originated homeopathy. We'll talk about him a little bit more. Um, and he tested it, found it satisfactory, and began using it. And then he uh, returns to the U.S. in 1824, opening a practice in New York City. So that's how it entered the country. And um, I do remember, if I didn't put this in here, that it spread from his introduction to it to the different doctors because he ended up treating the different doctors who got well. And they said, oh, I want to study it. And so that's how it spread. Um, and I might mention, too, as a digression, that homeopathy, I won't go into a lot of, about that except to say to you that compared to conventional medical practice, there's a different view of what you're dealing with. Conventional medical practice sees symptoms as a disease, something to kind of get rid of somehow with a drug or with surgery. Or, and whereas um, the homeopathic work was based on a discovery that if you use certain substances, what we call remedies from herbs and minerals and from animal products, they can actually stimulate the natural healing process in the body. So it sees symptoms as Symptoms are interpreted as the evidence that the body's trying to heal itself, and it's not seen as disease. So briefly, that's the difference between the two. So uh, in 1829, he was elected president of the New York Medical and Philosophical Society, and um, his cure, as I mentioned, fellow doctors brought interest to the method. Several doctors began to study it and to use it. Um, the Medical Society of the County of New York made Samuel Hahnemann, who was the doc German doctor originated homeopathy 200 years ago, made him an honorary member in 1832. There was that much respect for him. With time, homeopathy was found to be most popular with the affluent patients, and this led to opposition by the non-homeopathic doctors. And there was hostility and ridicule of homeopathy because of the economic differences between the two groups, you see. They were getting the people with more money, and, and the other doctors didn't like that, of course. Nonetheless, homeopathy spread to New England and then to the Mid-Atlantic, Southern States, and the Midwest. And I'll, we're going to talk about one of the big reasons for it spreading was how amazingly effective it was in epidemics. So let's talk a little bit about epidemics and the progress that came about because of homeopathic treatment. And what we're, gonna, what, we're, what we're referring to in epidemics at that time, in the 1800s, were mostly cholera, scarlet fever, smallpox, malaria, typhoid. Uh, these were all serious illnesses that had a high mortality, high death rate. I mean, compared to what's going on today with the virus, mm -hmm. it's a joke. Well, do you know what kind of rates they were? Well, they would range anywhere from 15, 20% up to wow. 70%. Wow. Yeah. Of infection mortality rate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really amazing. The 
you know, a lot of it was sanitation, a lot of it was things we didn't understand about it, but still, this is why they were so scary, and this is why they're so significant. So, um, the obvious success of homeopathy led to it spreading fairly rapidly through the 1800s, and by the 1880s, there were 20 homeopathic medical colleges in the United States. This is our history. Every state had a homeopathic medical society. And so I'm going to show you just briefly here some pictures so you understand how important this was as a medical practice in our society in the United States. Okay, so here's a brief survey of homeopathic hospitals. This is a homeopathic medical and surgical hospital of Pittsburgh, 220 beds, established in 1866. It's a real hospital. Look at the size of it. All homeopathic. Middletown State Homeopathic Hospital for the Insane in Buffalo, New York, had over a thousand beds, 17 homeopathic doctors, treated 11,000 patients between 1874 and 1916. Wow. And this is just a small part of the total institution. Isn't that amazing to see that? Wasn't it like one in four in the U.S. at some point? Uh, doctors, probably. Hospitals? Yeah, I think something like that. Buffalo Homeopathic Hospital in Buffalo, New York, uh, that was there between 1872 and 1923. Uh, Hospital of the Good Shepherd in Santa Cruz, New York, again, pretty good sized place. Um, it, this is a, a close up of the ho of the homeopathic part of what I just showed you there, and it had opened in 1891. It had 40 beds. With home this is all homeopathic again. And University of Iowa, Homeopathic Medical Building. Homeopathic Hospital Reading, Pennsylvania, opened in 1888. Pennsylvania State Asylum for the Insane. Westboro Insane Hospital in Massachusetts. Isn't it amazing? It was treating insanity. Huh. Now, we're going to talk about yellow fever as the main focus I'm going to discuss with you in terms of epidemics being treated as an example. It's not the only one. The other ones I mentioned to you uh, were also treated with it, you know, but uh, we're going to talk about uh, treatment of yellow fever in the U.S. as, a, as a, the best example here. And so the thing is, what is yellow fever? You see the, the eye there and how yellow it is around it, that's called icterus or jaundice. You've heard of jaundice? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because usually something wrong with the liver, mm -hmm. yeah. serious problem with the liver. And that was why it's called yellow, because that's what happened to people. It was spread by mosquitoes, they didn't know that. Um, it affected the internal organs with fever, especially the liver, resulting in this appearance. The first outbreak in English-speaking North America occurred in New York City in 1668. The yellow fever epidemic of 1793 in Philadelphia, which was in the capital of the United States, 1793, resulted in the deaths of several thousand people, more than 9% of the total population of the city. Oh. You can see how impressive that is. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it doesn't even compare to the No. The, the national government fled the city, including George Washington. New Orleans in the Mississippi Valley was plagued by it during the 19th century. The New Orleans, down by the ocean <clears throat> and up the Mississippi Valley with the, Miss the river there, <clears throat> was particularly affected by this, yes. by yellow fever. Yeah. Mosquitoes probably yeah. was the factor. <clears throat> the disease traveled along steamboat routes from New Orleans, resulting, causing some 100,000 to 150,000 deaths in total. Which was a lot compared to their population. Mm -hmm. It was a lot. Big percentage. So here's treatment outcome comparison. In 1853, at the Mississippi State Hospital in Natchez, the allopathic, the allopaths refer to what we now call conventional medicine, the ones where they use drugs and surgery and so on. Um, homeo, homeopath, homeo means same, like homosexual, homeo. So use a remedy that matches the symptoms to stimulate healing. Aloe means other. 
So allopathy means you use a substance that's not like the disease, that mm. counters it. That's where the term comes from. Mm. So the allopathic practitioners lost 55% of their patients, the mortality rate of 55%. Two homeopathic doctors in the same epidemic treated 555 cases with a mortality rate of 6%. Wow. Look at that difference. Yep. Can you imagine if you were a doctor at the time and you see that? Like, Lost 55% mm -hmm. versus 6%. Gotta get mm -hmm. rid of them. But it's interesting to read as a digression of the history here. The attitude of some, some of the doctors are impressed and they began to study it. That's why it spread through the U.S. It was mostly results like this. But some doctors said, Oh, this is bullshit. They're making it up. They're lying. And so they just wouldn't accept it. I remember reading about one doctor who talked about his conversion, and he kept hearing results like this, and he said, no way, that's not happening. And finally, he was so annoyed by it that he actually began, after other homeopathic doctors would tell him about a patient that recovered, he'd get the patient's name, and then afterwards he'd sneak over there and go in and talk to the patient himself. And he found out they were telling the truth, and he became homeopath. Oh, how funny! Yeah. <laughs> Between 1853 and 1878, there were 6,500 cases of yellow fever treated with homeopathy in the greater New Orleans area, with a loss of only 360 patients, a mortality of 5.5 percent. Isn't that amazing? And that's a percentage of people who were Over treated. six thousand, yeah, yeah of just, those that were sick with the disease. Right, clinically sick. Only a, a, about a little over 5% actually died from it with this treatment compared to 50 some percent. Ten times more. So here's the big epidemic of 1878. Started, New Orleans is down here at the bottom and it goes up the, up the valley, up the Mississippi Valley here. Greenville. Okay, had 299 deaths out of a, uh, I'm not reading, 1,100 cases, 27% mortality. Holly Springs had a 72% mortality, and Port Gibson had 275 deaths out of 1,500 cases. Are these homeopathic? No. No. Oh. This is a conventional treatment, so you can see. So like 18 to 15, 72 percent of the big range built? A lot more than homeopathic ones. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Meridian had 86 deaths, 23 percent. See, the mortality range from in the 20s up to much higher. Overall death rate for the city of New Orleans was 4,600 out of 27,000 cases. So it wasn't as high as some of the others, but it was a 17 percent mortality. Does anyone ever get yellow fever anymore? Do you know? Yeah, it still happens. It's just not as common. For the whole Mississippi Valley, it was almost 16,000 deaths out of 74,000 cases, 21% mortality. Okay, <clears throat> you can imagine the fear and the horror of the population was extreme. They're called shotgun quarantines that they instituted in many towns to keep out strangers. And these were men who would go out with their guns around the perimeter of the town, yeah. would not allow anybody to enter. Sound a little familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Sound a little bit like Costco, huh? Worse than a lockdown. And then, quote, brother fled from brother. Mm. Even parents abandoned their children. Oh, and little nice. ones were found dead in their beds with their shoes having oh. died unattended and alone. Ew. Unbelievable. They were so frightened. Now let's look at the homeopathic treatment in this epidemic. Established records, these are records of the treatment by homeopathic physicians in contrast to the usual statistics. In New Orleans, the homeopathic physicians had treated almost 2,000 cases with a loss of 110, a mortality rate of 5.6% instead of 17. In the rest of the South, they treated almost 2,000 cases, a mortality rate of 7.7%. The homeopathic treatment that you see, the contrast between the conventional and the homeopathic, 
made such a profound impression on Congress at the time, and public opinion in the South, as the overall death rate was reported by other practitioners, at least 16% and probably higher. So it really impressed the government. And the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1902 estimated the allopathic mortality to be between 20 and 25%. So this is a monument that was built in honor of Dr. Hahnemann, the originator, because of their appreciation for what homeopathy had done. It's, a, 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 it's located in Washington, D.C., within view of the White House. If it's still standing. Yep, yeah, it's still, standing. It's still there. I, I, I have actually been there. Uh, if I were to stand there in the middle, my head would almost reach where his figure is. That's how big it is. It's huge. Okay. When it was uh, when it was built and dedicated, the President of the United States attended. Oh. It's amazing. There aren't many doctors that have a monument like this in their honor. By contrast, what kind of treatments were the allopaths giving them, do you think? Were Probably a lot of bloodletting, blood uh, purging, <laughs> drugs that cause diarrhea, sweating, that kind of stuff. Mercury. So uh, this is uh, interesting to see how much, how much impression homeopathy had on the United States and our history. Established in 1900 by an act of Congress. Um, this is a close-up of, of Dr. Hahnemann sitting there in the middle, and it was a gift from the American Institute of Homeopathy. We'll talk about that in a, a little bit later. <clears throat> so, is this an exception? In other words, is um, what I just showed you, well, it just happened that way, but it doesn't work for other problems. Mm. You know, I'm not going to go into all the other epidemics because it would be a long history. But I'm going to show you here something that I think kind of answers this question to some extent. And we're going to talk about <coughs> pneumonia. Okay? And um, as an alternative treatment for pneumonia, homeopathy, we're going to talk about more current times in the year 2000, not that long ago, so it's still going to be relevant here. In the year 2000, pneumonia influenza was the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. Okay, this is probably uh, still the same, I would imagine. I don't think they have any other particular drugs that they can use other than antibiotics. So uh, it was the eighth leading cause of death. Untreated low bar pneumonia has a mortality rate of 30% in the year 2000. Mm. Antibiotics help some, but even with those of people over age 12, the mortality rate's at least 18% with conventional me medical, more modern medical treatment. The reported mortality for community-acquired pneumonia is on average 12%, and hospital-acquired pneumonia is 50 to 70% mortality. What? Where if so you're in a hospital, sick, waiting yes. for surgery or something, you went in with another problem, you got pneumonia in the hospital, your death rate is 50% or that, higher. That's what takes you out is the pneumonia. You've heard that, people dying of pneumonia yeah. in the hospital, yeah. Yep. Incredibly yeah. high mortality. So I want you to look at the high mortality anywhere from, what was the first one, 18% yeah. yeah. or something, up to 70% yeah. mortality, okay? Homeopathy is not, isn't really used very much now for treatment of that. But back in 1928, before there were antibiotics, okay, homeopathic physicians treated over 11,000 cases of pneumonia with just homeopathy with a mortality rate of 2.8%. Mm. Same disease. Mm. Where went homeopathy? I mean, we go all, when I present this to you, if you don't think I'm making it up, pulling it out of my rear end, you have to ask yourself, well, why isn't it around? Right? It had that much history. It had all those hospitals, all those doctors. The AMA. I know why, I think. Well, we're going to find out. <clears throat>
to be completely honest, you know, some of the issues were within homeopathy itself. There was some conflict within homeopathy as to what the best method was. Right. There, there was some argument about what dilutions to use and so on, things like that. Still is. Yeah, there still is. But it did require quite a bit of study. There were hundreds of homeopathic medicines you had to study and read and know about. And, and you also had to pay a lot of careful attention to your patient. A lot of careful examination, a lot of careful questioning. It took time. Lots of questions. And another one factor was patent medicines emerged. Mm -hmm. And patent, that's the term, what patent medicines were, were drug formulas that pharmacies made for certain conditions. So like number 12 is for diarrhea, number 13 mm -hmm. was for uh, shingles or whatever. So all the doctor had to do was just diagnose it and go get it off the shelf and give it to you. Much simpler practice. It was very appealing to a lot of people. There was also the germ theory, and that took on the minds of a lot of people, so they felt like the allopathic system had understood it more thoroughly. There was new technology like x-ray and other devices that came out through the allopathic system. <coughs> Anesthetics as well. So you see, all these things were considered advances. Anesthesia? Anesthesia, yeah. And, uh, but we come to political conflict. This is a big factor. So, in 1844, Going back to the 1800s, when homeopathy was growing, and I showed you all those homeopathic hospitals and medical schools that were, didn't show you, but they were there. This is a major figure, this guy, Constant Hearing. He founded the American Institute of Homeopathy, the very first national medical association. In 1847, the AMA, was organized, founded with 250 delegates to combat homeopathy. <laughs> that was their reason for forming. <laughs> they said in their clause of the rules, it forbade working with any homeopathic doctor. Homeopathic doctors in the Civil War were denied hospital access and not allowed to treat the same patient another doctor was treating. Hmm. They even had a rule that if you were a member of their organization and you talked to a homeopathic doctor, you were expelled. Oh. And it's on record there was a fellow expelled for that reason who talked to his wife, who was a homeopath. <laughs> 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 a little attitude here. <laughs> By 1930, there was only one homeopathic school left in operation. This also had to do with the development of antibiotics. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, I heard that there was something in 1910 called the Flexner Act. Yes, the Flexner Report. Are you going to talk about that? Or I don't remember I, if I put that in or not. Because what happened is I learned about this with uh, Truth About uh, Cancer docu-series. Mm -hmm. And in 1910, it put 10,000 <coughs> 10, homeopathic doctors out of business. Mm -hmm. They started uh, mm -hmm. making them prescribe drugs and they told them what to teach in medical school yes. to prescribe the drugs. Right. The Flexner, uh, Flexner. Abraham Flexner, I think it was. He, he was hired by the Carnegie Institute, I think it was, to evaluate medical schools. And when he did, he put all the homeopathic at the bottom. So a, that's a big factor in their closing. Do you have a sense of how much all that was kind of run politically by the financial interests of the pharmaceutical companies, or was it... Well, they were becoming powerful because I showed in the earlier slide there, they were developing these these formulas, and they were selling a lot of them, and they were becoming stronger, and they saw the homeopathic as competition. Right. So, of course, that was going to be a factor. I don't know how much of a factor, but mm -hmm. I think it must have been. But by 1930, there was one homeopathic school still in operation. By 1959, the last homeopathic school closed. Mm -hmm. And there were only 75 homeopathic doctors left in the United States. Hmm. So the AMA, AMA just basically shut it down. Not Interestingly, so. also, another factor was that all along, 
during this period of time was homeopathic data was rejected. Okay? Historically, homeopathic journals were separate from other journals because they couldn't get published in the, in the standard journals. Mm -hmm. So they had to form their own journals. Right? If they tried to submit their results to another journal, they were rejected. So, okay, got to do our own journals. Because homeopathic studies and research were not what were considered to be the respectable journals, they were thought not reliable. Oh, well, they're not in the, the respected journals, they're in their own journals. Can't trust them. The lack of inclusion of such data very much influenced the public view of the method, giving it a negative view since they weren't in the respected journals like Nature or whatever. They were probably considered to be baseless, huh? Yeah. So here's an example. <laughs> heard. Even with their success uh, numbers. Here's an example of this, what I'm talking about. Now this is going to go back to England, but it's a good example. Oh, first of all, I'm going to show you. Um, we're going to talk about cholera in England. At the moment is an example of how the data was handled. And I found this little, I'm going to play this for you, it's just a, less than a minute long. It's a little video from a movie, it's called The Secret Garden. Have any of you seen that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's not a very good resolution, I just copied it from a There's play a on Netflix. There's a couple versions of that movie. But the story is, to, to remind you if, you if you saw it, was it's about this young girl whose family dies and she's an orphan and she goes to England and now, she, you know, she changes the people around her in a positive way. It's a nice story. But this is the beginning of the movie where she's in, with her family in India. And her family's all sitting around the table having dinner together. And this is how it goes. So that's what cholera was like. People would get it, within a few hours they'd be dead. Really? Well, what is, what was it caused by? Caused by a Vibrio uh, bacteria. Yeah, it, bacteria. But it, was just, it, it adapted itself over time and became not quite so severe, but at this time that's the way it was. Yeah. People were terrified of it. And cholera was the first epidemic that homeopathy proposed treatment for, Dr. Hahnemann did. And uh, it was amazing, one remedy he recommended was Stopped it immediately if he, as soon as you had symptoms. So, so anyway, we're going to, and now that you see what cholera is like, we're going to talk about an epidemic that occurred uh, in London in 1854. And this is considered, and if you study epidemiology, it's considered a really important historical record, this particular epidemic. A most heavily significant epidemic was this one at the London Homeopathic Hospital. All of the wards of the hospital were devoted to the care of the affected individuals. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Where they say all the wards are now for the people with the virus. There were 61 cases of cholera treated at the London Homeopathic Hospital. It was a homeopathic hospital. Ten died. They had a, a, a mortality rate of 16%. And then there was another group that they classified as 331 people with simple diarrhea. I, they don't really define that, but I assume it's just all they have is diarrhea, they didn't have any other symptoms, so they considered it to be a, a different form of it or something. And they weren't so, and they only had one that died in that group. So those with cholera, 16%, uh, those without the full-blown case, one, one died out of 331. The neighboring hospital, which was an allopathic hospital in Middlesex, had 231 cases of cholera 
and 47 of just the diarrhea, the, the simple, so-called simple diarrhea. Of the cholera patients they had, they had a fatality rate of 53%. So the homeopathic was 16, and theirs was 53%. One of the victims was a nurse caring for the patient. Mm -hmm. Between the two hospitals, treatment outcome very different, 16% for homeopathy, 53% for allopathic. Now, here's an interesting testimony. So this is from a Dr. McLaughlin, who was a major figure at the time in terms of doctor that was a respected authority and published papers and so on. And he was one of the medical inspectors appointed by the General Board of Health who visited the wards and examined the cases under treatment and watched their progress. All right? So here's what he said <clears throat> afterwards. You are aware that I went to your hospital prepossessed against the homeopathic system, to you, that you had in me, in your camp, an enemy rather than a friend. And I need not tell you that I have taken some pains to make myself acquainted with the rise progress and medical treatment of cholera, and that I claim for myself some right to be able to recognize the disease and to know something of what the medical treatment ought to be. There may therefore be no misapprehension about the cases I saw in your hospital. I will add that all I saw were true cases of cholera in the various stages of disease, and that I saw several cases which did well under your treatment, which I have no hesitation in saying would have sunk under other. In conclusion, I must repeat to you that I have already told you that what I have told everyone whom I have conversed, that although an allopath by principle, education and practice, yet were at the will of providence to afflict me with cholera and deprive me of the power of prescribing for myself, I would rather be in the hands of a homeopathic mm -hmm. than an allopathic physician. <laughs> He'd be strung up Isn't today. that interesting? <laughs> oh, fire. So, the treatments after the epidemic was over were evaluated. A circular was addressed by the president of the Board of Health to the various met metropolitan hospitals and the qualified practitioners requesting returns of cholera cases with details of the circumstances and the treatment and the results. They're going to evaluate how it went after the epidemic was over. The object of it was to determine by comparison for the public good what treatment experience showed to be the best for the new plague. The returns were sent in from the London Homeopathic Hospital, giving the names and the addresses of the patients treated, the symptoms, the remedies, and the result in each case, and a summary of results. The government report that was then issued was presented to the Parliament without the slightest reference to the London Homeopathic Hospital or its results. The brilliant results which his physicians had achieved. They just left it out. Mm. <laughs> Complaint was made, of course, by the homeopath, to the board, and they referred to the medical committee. With the result, the board received from the committee the following response as to why they did that. They said, that by introducing the returns of homeopathic practitioners, they, the treatment committee, would not only compromise the value and utility of their averages of cure, as deduced from the operation of known remedies, but they would give an unjustifiable sanction to an empirical practice, alike opposed to the maintenance of truth and the progress of science. <laughs> Well, there, it was persisted by Lord Robert uh, Grosvenor that they do something about it and publish it. And finally, it was published as a separate piece in May of 1855, and is still in the parliamentary papers of today. 
the homeopathic results finally was published with a great deal of resistance. But you see the problem. You know, see, when the dominant medical system simply refuses it and will not consider an alternative, mm -hmm. just will not consider it, and just ignores it. So, I now go to our current political situation, my opinions. Our current political situation is that in the U.S. we now have a medical monopoly. There are other treatments you could find available to a limited degree, but they're, they are very limited. And the reason that there's a monopoly is that the allopathic system put down all the other methods of treatment during their rise. It's interesting that we as a culture don't acknowledge it as monopoly. You know, we have some rules, don't we, about some companies can't have monopolies. Like antitrust. Yeah, antitrust. That if you have a monopoly, the government can come in and break it apart and so on. But they don't recognize that it's a medical monopoly. Hmm. They simply don't recognize it. They say there's just the one way to do it. So chiropractors and... The and chiropractors, the chiropractors interestingly enough, the chiropractors were able to survive. All the other homeopathy and uh, osteopathic and others were put down. And uh, the story I heard was the reason the chiropractors were able to survive was that they were in the process of sh shutting down chiropractic as well, you know, back a few years, and they were planning how to do it. And there was some guy that was part of the group there that recorded the conversation <laughs> and released it. And once it came out what they were doing, they had to stop Love it. it. <laughs> and that's why chiropractic <laughs> continued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get your tape recorder together. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So health insurance is focused on supporting the allopathic medical system. That's the problem. If you have health insurance, you're pretty much limited. If you're going to go to an alternative, mm -hmm. you've got to pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So it really puts down availability. <clears throat> and many alternatives, such as homeopathy, have no insurance coverage, make it difficult in the marketplace. <clears throat> Hospital access is also limited so that serious conditions or injuries force one to embrace the monopoly. You don't have any place else to go. If you go to a hospital, you have to be allopathic. So, so back, in, back in the day, they could have like set your bones or whatever, but <coughs> oh, yeah. given you a yeah. remedy that would have helped you. The homeopathic doctors were certain. I have a book um, written by a homeopathic surgeon. I mean, they did surgery, they set bones, they did all that stuff. They were full. Awesome. Full range doctors, but now it'll come back. It'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be nice. <laughs> During our lifetime. <coughs> yes, it well, we're just yeah. about done here. Pretty soon. Well, uh, our lifetime. Our <laughs> <laughs> lifetimes. <laughs> I did everything you could afford. <laughs> oh, funny. You could afford. So that's it. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Talk about that. Yeah. What? No, just you know, well, you didn't say anything about the <coughs> the lobbying. It's right. The lobby. They pay the lobbyers to go in yes. and make the government do. Yeah, well, as we know, there's all sorts of political stuff. But going now around. it's just got become so normal that yeah, I don't even know if they have to lobby now. Well, it, especially when you get in the field of medicine, because it really more than almost anything else, it's almost like a religion. It you is. don't question it. Or you're a heretic. No, it is. Yeah. Well, it's like you didn't mention it. It's also, although that last homeopathic, I mean, they're just about out of business, you know, in the 1950s. It did come back, especially in the 70s and 80s. It was growing well, pretty pretty rapidly, but then it got suppressed again by yeah. the allopaths. And, and lately, it's especially, there's been a moral homeopathy. Yeah, now they're talking about the, the current thing is now that uh, presumably from the, the pressures of the homeopath, of the, of the, pharmaceutical houses that they want to make the FDA change its rules about homeopathy. <clears throat> the regulation of homeopathy goes back a century or more. The standards about what kind of medicine, how they're developed and how they're to be used and so on. There's, I have a book on it, the, the rules, how they're to be done, made for the pharmacies. And so when the, as time went along, they, the, those rules were accepted as to be continued. You heard the term grass, generally generally recognized as safe. That was a mm -hmm. term that was used for medicines that were been used for decades. They want to change that. 
They want the FDA is in the process of now saying you can't use homeopathic remedies unless they've all been tested. It costs over a million dollars for each test. There's a thousand remedies. It's not going to happen. So if they have their way, it could very well shut down homeopathy here, the sale of remedies. But anyway, that aside, um, homeopathy has had some comeback. There's more of it available than there used to be, and there's more practitioners out there. But unfortunately, because the schools had disappeared, and there isn't really kind of consistent coherence to it, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different views and different schools, and they don't all agree with each other. So it's a little confusing. Did it get but, shut down primarily in the U.S.? Was it still going on in Europe? Yeah, it goes. It's, it's still active in India, South America, and in Mexico. You can go to any pharmacy and buy remedies. Mm -hmm. But That's we heard during this pandemic that they were weren't they outlawing its use in India? No, it's used in India. I think there was something about uh, one of the remedies suggests. I don't remember the detail, but there was no, some. I thought a whole area that was the prime minister or whatever he is in yeah. India said to use it, and they were using it, and they were having great results. And then he got there was something like that, some kind of political and he thing. Stopped yeah. Paying. Wanna... yeah. So most of the homeopathy spread over most of the world. It's not so much in the east, not so much in China. It has now gone into Japan, um, but it's spread, you know, um, South Africa, South America, most of Europe, still, still very much used in, in Germany, in France, France, Britain, Australia. But there's in all these countries, there's still the struggle. The the more powerful companies or medical systems are trying to control it or put it down, take it out of the health system. Still going on, just like we know it's happening in this country with things. Susan was raising the, 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 the issue of what's called genus epidemicus, which is a term that means that was discovered early on, going back to the cholera and yellow fever and other epidemics like that. One of the ideas in homeopathic medicine is that the everything that exists on the earth has a life force behind it. It's called life force or vital force. That's the term that was used. We know it's the same meaning, more or less, I would say the same meaning as in the Asian cultures, they call it chi, you know, that it's non-physical and it circulates through the body and maintains it. So the, the meaning of the vital, what's called the vital force in homeopathy or the life force is that it's a non-physical influence or informational pattern or energy or whatever you want to call it that brings about the physical form and maintains it. And that's what you're treating in homeopathy. You're not treating the physical level, you're treating this energetic level. Cool. Kind of like the etheric. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. Because they said, the, you know, in our, in, our, in our contemporary culture, for, for the most part, there's always exceptions. Different people have different views. But, you know, for the most part, our, our, our culture and our science and our medical system is very much uh, materialistic and in, in the sense that the physical world is primary mm -hmm. and everything is derived from the physical world you know secondary like consciousness is a it's derived from the physical form the brain it's called an epiphenomenon you know mm -hmm. whereas so many other uh, views like like Ch Chinese medicine or homeopathy or others it's the opposite there's consciousness first, and out of that comes the physical world, you see. So, and that's part of the conflict. Well, a lot of people won't accept it. Well, that's, yeah, that's crazy, that's voodoo, you know. So, so anyway, it was discovered that, that when there's epidemics, compared to most, most kind of diseases that arise from all sorts of causes and injuries and toxic effects and poisons or whatever it is, <clears throat> that when there's an epidemic, there's an energy behind that epidemic. It's like, it's like a, an identity, like you and I have an identity. There's an identity to that virus. There's an identity to that, that bacteria. Like and an it's the same in all that. patients. It's one disease occurring in all patients. And the energy behind it is the same in every single patient. That was discovered through the work with homeopathy. Well, the nice thing about that is that you could then find the medicine that fit that one uh, influence, you see. 
And the way you did it was you take a large number of patients, maybe 20 patients, and combine them all together, all their symptoms. And once you have all the symptoms in one big package, you find the medicine that seems most suitable to treat that. And you could use that same medicine in all other patients. And it's just amazing that it could work that way. That's why it was so easily done in epidemics. Once they figured out the remedy, all the doctors told each other, and, oh yeah, okay, give them all. And you could do it as a preventive as well. Whereas with most other conditions, it had to be very individual. Yeah, other conditions, you had to do an individual prescription. It, it varied too much. It took a lot of work. But it was really different with epidemics. That's interesting. And the same thing with the virus epidemic of today, there is a, an energy identity behind it. I came up with the, the suggestion for the remedy Nux Vomica, if any of you know what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As the one that fits that, and I've been handling my veterinary colleagues, you know, and I've had dozens of reports of how effective it is in stopping the nux. What is there a standardized accepted thing is what is an epidemic and what is a pandemic? What, what no, we, no, those are just terms. Pandemic just means it's, it's over large areas. Okay. It's like the world. A, but what, what makes it just like everybody's sick, oh, it's an epidemic. Is there actually a thing that... I think it's like 5% of the population has well, to be affected. Yeah, I'm sure they have different that. rules, but I, I, I think I wouldn't make it so complicated. I think back in the 1800s and so on, it was just quite obvious. I mean, people going along, maybe you had colds or whatever, flu occasionally, and then all of a sudden a large number of people got sick. I'm thinking more about the current time that they're throwing out this term when people are just getting sick. Yeah. But now they've, now they've raised the bar and said, oh, they're not just getting sick, they're in an epidemic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think we probably had enough, haven't we? I appreciate yeah, all the questions. Really, uh, it's yeah. very interesting. There's so much to learn, isn't there? Yeah. And um, I think the central, as I say, just to emphasize the, 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 the thing I'd like to communicate without trying to take position making everybody bad, is that we, as a culture, we have done things like this, like, you know, put down other systems that sometimes are very valuable mm -hmm. for, for not very good reasons. And we have to learn to be more open-minded, and we have to be learn to inquire and be not just so attached to money, and, and profit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I think is just an example of that because we have a system that showed itself to be very good, very effective, mm -hmm. and, um, and yet was eliminated, which is which is sad to hear, really. Do you think it okay. could come back? It certainly could. I, I just don't know. I mean, yeah. I have no idea. Um, You're doing what you can to help. Well, I've been it. using it my whole adult life, so mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. It has, I always find people to help me or, or mm -hmm. Well, like, like an example, <clears throat> another example comes to mind, it's like, <clears throat> I, th I know, I, without going into detail, there are books by homeopathic doctors in the last right. few decades that have been very successful treating cancer. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, very, just the same kind of results, that kind of significant difference in survival. Okay. So, but that is not considered to be acceptable by the medical profession. Uh, and, but the medical profession uses methods, as we know, that attack the body, that kill parts of your body, that kill the organs and so on, that's not, that are not effective. And I'll mention to you, there was a study that came out with, um, it was a doctor that, um, he was the editor of the National Cancer Journal of the National Cancer Institute, which is a very respected institution. He was, a, for, for a couple of decades, he was the editor of it, okay? He's a doctor, uh, he does statistics. And, and, once, and as part of his study one time, back in the 80s, he did a study on breast cancer in women and published historically, and he published his results. And he published in his results that there's no increase increased survival rate in women with breast cancer since the 1930s That's sad. with all the treatments that are being done that well that got out. a lot of bad feedback you know <laughs> um, it's better not imagine. to do anything if you have mm -hmm. breast cancer i but, mean not to do any other but i'm saying if it, if it, you know if what they're doing now really doesn't do any better than what it did then except bankrupt your family Right. Why don't we find other alternatives and start using them and making them acceptable, right? Maybe because it bankrupts your family and, and it's very profitable. But you know, it another thing be. I wanted to, to mm -hmm. say is it's, it's been interesting during this last year to see how 
even allopathic treatments such as hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and others that people have been finding to be effective for the current pandemic are, have really been suppressed in, you know, as, as badly as homeopathy. I mean, no. it's, just, it's like the monopoly aspect of what you're talking no. about is yeah, really Well, hopefully it'll tumble just like the government yeah. will. The whole thing <laughs> hopefully. will be employed on itself. I don't know. Yes. We'll find out. But anyway, I wanted to point out to you, though, the, the situation as it actually is. And, and it helps you, I think, to have a little bit more flexible view of things. You're not being quite so accepting of what authorities tell you about it, what mm -hmm. to do. Right.